shortly. We're, we're live. For joining us uh, this Thursday, December 3rd, for the ACA Small Business Bootcamp and Resource Collective, I'm Robert Theobald, Small Business Ombudsman and Vice President of Small Business Services. Um, for those that have been on the bootcamp sessions uh, for a while, uh, I am very glad to be back. I'm very glad that Faith did such a phenomenal job uh, covering while I was out. And uh, so I'm, I'm glad to try and host this session today. Hopefully my voice holds up uh, the whole thing, but uh, we're excited to be here. As always, we want to thank all of our partners. <clears throat> we could not do these boot camp sessions without them. They are vital to the success and the expertise and content that we uh, are able to provide. Um, we've been, been fortunate to have all their support. So the Small Business Boot Camp and Resource Collective is designed to help small businesses work through the COVID crisis. Um, many of us thought the COVID crisis would just be a short period uh, in April and May, and we've continued on as the, as the crisis has continued. And um, we're going to continue working with our statewide community partners uh, to do the boot camps through December, uh, through December 17th, and then continue on in 2021. So the boot camp and resource collective, you can find that on our website at azcommerce.com. And on our boot camp webpage, you can find the, it's the same page you went to to register for this today's sessions and, and other sessions you may have been on. And on that page down at the bottom, you can also find the archive that has all the previous sessions recorded and you can go back and view those at any time and download the content and materials from them. Additionally, on that site, you can link to our resource collective and this is where we add the additional information from our community partners uh, that can be used to help you run your business and uh, work through this time. So on that resource collective page, you can find some of these resources such as the unemployment insurance, reopening for restaurants, uh, barbershops and cosmetologists, construction, uh, general safety, uh, et cetera. So it's, a, it's got a plethora of information uh, available to you on that page. Uh, I got some key updates uh, today that are, that are very important. Uh, today's a big update day. First, just a reminder, it's National Tax Security Week. Uh, Lisa Novak on Tuesday talked about it briefly, but there's a number of great webinars for small businesses available on the IRS website. Um, and we have the link on there for you, it's kind of long, uh, but we can also post this in the chat here in a bit. Additionally, uh, if you saw the governor's press conference yesterday or uh, saw the news um, afterwards, the governor announced the new uh, safest outside restaurant assistance program. And it is a grant program for restaurants to help support them in expanding their premises so they can have additional seats that are safe uh, for their patrons. So um, it's, a, it's a great program. Um, I've got a link there to our website that has information on the program and additional details are gonna be coming out uh, by next Monday. But also in support of that, uh, next Wednesday, December 9th at 9 a.m., we have a special boot camp session set up for restaurant expansion. We also did a similar boot camp on week 30, and that session is recorded and available in our archives on our website. Um, but if you have a restaurant or know a restaurant owner, um, please let them know about these programs and these webinars. It is to support the restaurants and help them grow and work through this time. It's extremely challenging for them. And the final update is the uh, link here I have posted here for the A.DBE and Small Business Conference. It's next week. It's a virtual conference. It is free. So if you're a small business owner, I would definitely look at that. It's going to have some great opportunities on uh, just general business training, on doing business with the government, um, different ways that you can grow and expand your business as a small business owner. Um, A.DOT does a fabulous job. Uh, with DBEs and small businesses. And this is a yearly conference. I would encourage all of you to go to that link and attend as much as you can. Um, I will be on there on the 9th or 10th uh, with an open session. And we will have a uh, virtual booth. We're gonna have virtual booths for a lot of the vendors and partners. It's gonna be an interesting conference to see virtually, but I encourage everyone to uh, check it out. 
Additionally, a lot of the information can be found on our website, azcommerce.com forward slash COVID-19. Uh, this is for our business resources related to COVID-19. Uh, on our, when you go to that website and you see the financial resources, you can access the, the grants and information about the various different grants and loan programs that are available from the local, county, state, federal levels. Um, so great business resource as well. Additionally, the ACA has a number of programs to help support small businesses. We have our small business services. Um, we can help with you know, banking contacts, navigating the SBA and SBDC score and other resources available to small businesses. Our workforce can help with uh, hiring, uh, training, et cetera, and create programs there. And then our Arizona MVP Manufacturing Extension Partnership can help manufacturers with uh, A to Z uh, tools to, uh, across the board, they, uh, they're phenomenal. Um, and they have some programs right now as a result of the CARES Act. Uh, so if you're a manufacturer, definitely check out the Arizona MEP. Additionally, during this time, a lot of people are looking to start a side gig or starting their own business. And uh, we have a small business checklist that is an online uh, interactive resource uh, for entrepreneurs and businesses um, to help identify the local, state, and federal information needed to either start a business or expand a business line. Um, it's a great tool. And last, finally, I want to also remind everybody about the state's COVID-19 information and resource page, ArizonaTogether.org, uh, another great resource uh, for COVID-19 information. So with that, I want to take a quick look at the upcoming sessions for next week. Next week is the money week. Uh, we can call it uh, on Tuesday session is an update on the PPP program, uh, loan program. Wednesday is our restaurant uh, relief to help increase profits by leveraging temporary expansion of outdoor premises, expansion of premises for outdoor dining. And then Thursday is small business funding opportunities. Um, we're gonna have a number of different lenders to talk about some different programs that are available for small businesses that people just don't know about. And it's great to get the word out about these programs because they're very cool. So uh, please join us for those sessions next week. You can sign up on our website. So today we're excited to have Jim Pipper from the SBA, uh, works out of the, the Arizona District Office, and Paul Smiley, he's the founder of Sonoran Technology and Professional Services. I'm not gonna read through their biographies there, but uh, they'll, they'll be on our website and you can read through them, but they're both experts. Uh, I see Jim work with Jim all over the state on many things, and, and Paul is a business owner and former military person has, has uh, got some great information. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and we're going to pull up their presentation. And I'm going to go ahead and turn the time over to Jim. Hey, thank you very much, Robert and, and uh, Lisa and Faith and the other folks at the Arizona Commerce Authority for putting this on. Uh, we sure appreciate the opportunity to collaborate with you all and uh, to uh, introduce myself. Uh, you've seen my bio. Uh, I've been, uh, I'm not new at this game. I've been here in Arizona for 30 years and I've been trying to help Arizona small businesses across this great state of ours uh, since day one. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty proud of the fact that I wore out two government vehicles in the day. Uh, going from here to there, I kept running into Robert. So Robert, I knew I knew you were traveling as well, and and uh, it's a big state we uh, we're all in, and uh, it took a lot of time. So thanks to COVID, though, here we are uh, doing it virtually and talking with one another, and it's it's a it's actually a new fantastic way to communicate with each other. So what I want to mention, uh, uh, Robert already did a great job of showing some of our resource partners. Uh, we don't try to do this alone. Our district office is quite proud of what we've been doing here in Arizona, uh, but the way we do it is we team up with uh, not only our direct resource partners, our small business development centers that are attached to community colleges here and many of our communities, but our uh, uh, folks at the Arizona Commerce Authority and others, uh, certainly our uh, SCORE chapter, they don't like that acronym uh, and some of uh, that are out there doing business or trying to remain in business, uh, you wonder, well, what is score? No, it's not, we're not keeping score in a baseball game or a football game. 
uh, stands for Service Corps Retired Executives. They friggin' hate that acronym, but they're chartered under it and they were chartered 50 years ago and they haven't been able to figure out how to change their name, but they prefer to be called Mentors to America's Small Business. National program, uh, been around 50 years and a lot of business owners uh, simply still do not know how valuable their, their uh, uh, mentoring can be. So I encourage you to check out our website at www.sba.gov slash AZ. Put the slash and AZ after and you get on our state website. Uh, our other two resource partners, uh, we have one business, Women Business Center out of Tucson. And because of COVID and these webinars, we can uh, you can talk to the Women Business Center from wherever you're located, just like you're doing today. Lastly, we, uh, Paul and I are, are veterans, and uh, you can tell from Paul's background there, uh, he'll tell you about that. He, he uh, probably flew those while I fixed them. So, you know, he flew them, he broke them, he brought them back home, and I'm one of those guys that was on a flight line that fixed those. Uh, but as a uh, result of our veteran experience, uh, we have a Veteran Business Outreach Center here in Arizona, stationed out of Sierra Vista, ran by Margaret Evangelista. And uh, I would encourage any veterans that are on board to contact me or, or Paul or, or anyone. We all know uh, Margaret well, and she puts on a class called Boosa Business. Uh, we got one coming up over at Papico at the National Guard Center uh, that uh, is on the 16th of this month. So uh, that's our team, SCORE, SBDCs, uh, Women Business Center and our Veteran Business Outreach Center, as well as our district office. And as long as I'm mentioning that, uh, one thing that I want to say about our district office is I can't speak for the other 66 SBA offices. I'm sure they're all doing good, but I can speak for ours. When we say we want to help you, if you live here in Arizona, anywhere, we want to help you. So we're going to do that by putting a, a guy that has become uh, better known in my office than I am, uh, Mr. Paul Smiley, uh, veteran, Air Force veteran, just like me. Go Air Force. All right, Paul. Hey, thank you, Jim. Appreciate that. And to Faith and Lisa and uh, Robert over at the ACA, thank you so much for all the things you do for Arizona under the leadership of Ms. Sandra Watson. It is a fantastic organization. I remember several years ago when it stood up. Uh, it was just, you know, balls to the wall, getting this thing done. You guys have been so fantastic doing that. And over to Jim uh, Pipper and all the folks over at the SBA office under the direction of Mr. Blaney and Deputy uh, Shivani Dubey. Jim, is, I, I think they're the best in the country. I've talked to other SBA offices and my colleagues who deal with them and uh, heads up that the Arizona SBA office is, is the best in the country, in, in my opinion. We used to call uh, Jim Air Force Jim. So Jim, today I'm changing your name from Air Force Jim to Mr. SBA because you've really earned that title. So thank you so much. Uh, before yeah. moving forward, uh, it would be uh, remiss if, if I did not take a moment for I go on the call here to just have a moment of silence for all the Americans who have uh, died because of COVID-19. You couple that with the uh, economy and, and all the crisis we're going through, it's gonna take a total American effort of small business owners uh, and government agencies like ACA and SBA to get through this thing. So if you don't mind, I can take 15 seconds for just a moment of silence for all the Americans who have died through COVID-19. Uh, That's 250,000 and counting. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> As you can see from the uh, title of the slide, Small Business 2.0. And, and the question is, you know, why this presentation? Why Small Business 2.0? For the last six, seven months, I've heard a lot of people in government and industry talk about how the COVID-19 pandemic has devastated the small business community. However, what I have not heard uh, is any discussion on how to fix it or some remedies of how we move past this. And so that is the whole gist of the presentation. For those on the call who have been in business for six, seven years, five years, uh, you, you've been doing this for a while, 
uh, consider this a refresher. And I like the title that uh, Robert put on, it's a boot camp. We're gonna get back to the basics and ask some questions here. I don't have all the answers, but I would tell you this as small business owners, we know we can all help each other and learn from each other as we move forward uh, through this uh, pandemic. Next slide, please. Introductions you heard from the people on the phone, Jim and Faith uh, and Lisa and, and, uh, and, and Robert. You can get the information there. Uh, one thing I like about both those organizations is that uh, it's not free, but it doesn't cost you any money out of your pocket. Those programs and services are paid through our taxpayer dollars. So if you're not using them, you're not using uh, your taxpayer dollars very wisely. It is out there. The P-Tax, SBC, ACA, all that information out there costs you nothing because your tax dollars have paid for that. So here's kind of a list of things I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to go in detail, but trying to, in the next 40 minutes, kind of give you some thoughts. And uh, one thing I would like you to do as we go through this presentation is from time to time, put on your consumer hat. I think you'll get a different perspective from a small business uh, owner's perspective on this one. Next slide, please. So what is the future of small business? Uh, I really don't know, but I can tell you this. Uh, if you look at these areas here, these markets here, these are the ones that have been tremendously hurt uh, by the pandemic. And a significant share of the workers in these markets, about 40%, they're in occupation where there's a close physical proximity to their customers. Gyms, restaurants, bars, uh, stores, you name it, it's, a, it's that close proximity that doesn't allow them to work from home. And I'm gonna go into some, some details about each one of these industries based on some Federal Reserve information I received uh, several months ago about the impact. Next slide, please. So if you look at this chart here, you, you will see all these services impact small businesses, again, about 40%. And if you look at the ones that have been hurt the most on the far left of the slide, accommodation and food services, come on, uh, restaurants, hotels, airlines, that's a big hit. Other is retail, you can't go into the stores, and what's significant about this is every state is different. Uh, I'm at our corp, uh, one of our satellite offices here in Arlington Heights, Illinois, about 35 miles northwest of Chicago. And the state of Illinois has a complete lockdown on indoor, uh, indoor restaurant seating. You can't do that. Now, if you're in Florida, Arizona, as, as Robert just mentioned, Governor Deuce is going to expand some of the outside seating. Well, today I'm here to tell you it is 30 degrees outside in Chicago area and no one's eating outside. So you can see, even regionally through uh, uh, governance from the states and the cities there, there's impact uh, again across the board there. But this is kind of one of the things you see. Uh, when I came to Chicago, I drove across country. Uh, we stayed at a Marriott in Schaumburg, Illinois, which is about 35 miles northwest of Chicago. It is a big Marriott <clears throat> uh, uh, convention center, the whole nine yards. We were there for about twice for five days at a time. And I went down and talked to the manager and the occupancy rate was 5%. This was in June and July. No hotel, whether how big you are or small, can survive on 5% occupancy. So you can just tell that a lot of people were uh, out of work, housekeepers, restaurants, the bars, uh, IT folks, all those folks are out of work. And I'm not sure we've got back there yet, but you can see from this chart by the various industries there who have been hurt by this. And again, this comes from the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. Uh, but when you go up to the top one, wholesale trade, think about this. Again, put on your consumer hat. You go to Costco or you go to Sam's, they haven't, hurt, they haven't hurt, been hurt too much. The lines are still out the door. They put in COVID-19 parameters and protocols with masks and things like that. But you know, this gives you a good sense of, of who's been hurt the most based on industry model, particularly when it comes to accommodation in the service industry. Next one, please. So I did some reflecting back in, in, uh, in June and July, putting this program together, this presentation and trying to find out, wow, let me reflect on this. And one thing came to mind that I have, I've, I've never bought into the notion that entrepreneurs and small business owners are one and the same. So when you look back over the last seven, eight months, uh, have you heard the word entrepreneur use during this pandemic? Because I haven't. And that tells you, from my perspective at least, tells me uh, that there's a big difference between being an entrepreneur and a business owner. The, the entire weight of your company, 50 people, 500 people, 100 people, as a business owner, it falls on you. Pay, facilities, risk, insurance, that all falls on you. And you would know 
the difference by using this example. When you have to pay payroll out of your own pocket, you are no kidding a bona fide business owner. I'm just not sure that entrepreneurs carry the weight of a small business owner on their shoulders. And so think about that, but again, for me myself, I haven't heard the word entrepreneur used during this entire pandemic. I've heard small business owners use a heck of a lot. Next slide, please. So as I reflect and went down some research, I'm not gonna read all this data to you, but I wanna point out a couple of things that will help you as a small business owner kind of realize where, the, where we're at. And more particularly, how the US economy functions. So you can read that, but going to the third bullet says, uh, consumer spendings account for about 70% of economic activity. We are a consumer-based economy, 70%. If you went into a Walgreens or a, a, a Walmart in the IT section, you see these little yellow tabs there. And those yellow tabs say, I'm sorry, we're out of stock because most of those items are made overseas. We buy a lot of stuff from China and Japan and, and places like that, but we don't make a whole lot of stuff. And so it's very risky when 7% of our economy is consumer-based, you have a pandemic, people lose jobs, they don't have money to spend. You can see how this all kind of adds up. And they have this new term I'd like you to remember. It's called the digital consumer. And the largest digital consumer in the world are the Chinese. So when you think about consumer spending and how our economy actually works, the United States makes up 5% of the world consumer, only 5%. So there's a lot of other opportunities out there overseas, but we are a very small fish in the pond when it comes to the economy. We have the largest economy in the world, but 70% is spending money. That's how we generate businesses. And so a pandemic or recession, I term those as small business killers especially in a consumer-based economy. I'm gonna get a bit more deeper into this and kind of show you how that may have affected your business and uh, in, 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 in come up in the future. Next slide, please. Uh, to be honest with you, and you, you probably watched uh, some of the news channels and financial channels, a lot of small businesses are hurting. We understand that. But there's a lot of small businesses who are even hurting worse than that. These are the small businesses who have made the decision, we are not gonna make it, and we're closing our doors permanently. We have to feel for those folks. Imagine putting 10 or 15 years of hard work at this business and then through the pandemic and economic crisis is, you know, you just can't stomach anymore. You, you just can't do it. It's not like, you know, uh, building a house down in Florida and, and then four hurricanes come, he goes, I'm going to rebuild again. This is your life work and your family's life work more likely. Uh, years and years to get it done. So the real question I'm hoping you ask yourself after this presentation today have you decided to be a part of a small business 2.0? I can't answer that question for you, but hopefully we will give you some, uh, some points and tips that may help you make a good decision. Next slide. So, uh, and Jim mentioned our Boost to Business program, Boots to Business, a veteran uh, program that we run several times a year around the state of Arizona. And one question I oftentimes ask small business owners, so why did you go into business? And we get quite a few types of answers. Uh, but the answer people are oftentimes afraid to give is, hey, I went into business to make money. And for some reason, they're kind of bashful about saying that. But if you're not making money, it's simply a hobby. Uh, but as I'll say, say a little later there, uh, if making money is your number one reason for going into business, you're going to probably have some difficulties. And I'm going to go by that step by step and tell you why that could happen. Next slide. So for me, when I retired, at the 25 years in the Air Force in uh, August of 2002, I went to work for industry. But my military career as an officer and a commander taught me always put people first. And so when I went into industry, that was not the mantra that was preached to me and that was given to me. It was about money, 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 money. And it went against my value system. And so uh, in 2007, uh, during the, the height of the economic recession, I started Sonoran Technology. Uh, people thought I was absolutely crazy. Look out the front window, there is a recession going on, the worst since 1932. But I read this book and the book was entitled, God is my CEO. It's not a religious book, it's a, it's a business book based on faith principles. Uh, and so the long story short is that 
back in 2007, let's go back to 2005, the SBA would tell you within the first two years, half of small businesses fail in a normal economy. In 2007, that number probably had to be 75% of businesses fail. And I'm here to tell you, we are strong today. We're in the black, we're doing well. We've done very well for the last years because our principles have not been on making money. It has been on these two words, life change. Life change for me and life change for the employees who work for our company. I report to no one on this earth. I don't, I have no stockholders to answer to so I can afford to take a risk and I can afford to do the right thing uh, and one of our company culture mo models is people before profit. And it has served us well. So, you know, when I was with the other company, I retired in 2002, I was in this fishbowl around a lot of sharks and it was all about making money. So I, I changed that process. And the first people I talked to when I launched this company was Jim Pipper and his team down at the SBA office. And they gave me great advice and great support. So did SCORE and some other folks around, around Arizona. So as you look to this, challenge if you're going to decide to go into business or stay in business, uh, look at why you're going into business. Every company needs a purpose and a, a mission statement. Next one. So our purpose is people will, for profit and life change. Of course, you can read our vision statement and our mission statement. They're there for you to see. But I would tell you, if you dig deep and peel the onion back, I'll be interested to find out how many companies have a purpose statement for going into business. It's very important to get that done. Uh, so make that list, make that a top priority. You haven't done that. You probably have a vision statement. You probably have a vision, a uh, mission statement, but come up with a purpose statement that includes something more than money. And I think it will serve you well as you make the decision whether or not you're going to be uh, around for the post pandemic success. Next. So there's a list, two slides here, a list of questions that I think uh, uh, business owners should ask themselves. Uh, and the one is, is this really what I want to do? I've heard, you know, through our Boost the Business program and other presentations we've given, people, uh, one guy said, I'm going to business, I want to have more free time. You want to have more free time? I would tell you, I probably work 10 to 12 hours a day, you know, probably not as a computer all day, but as a business owner, there's always something going on. You got COVID-19, you got a contract, got a personal problem, maybe someone has a sick, sick child. It just goes on and on and on. I got to talk to the bank tomorrow, so forth and so on. Is this really what you want to do? And if you're looking for more free time, this is probably not the thing to do. If you're looking for more freedom, independence, that is probably a good thing to do. Uh, the second uh, bullet there for commitment is, do I have the energy to see this thing through? I just mentioned, it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort. And so uh, please consider that. The second bullet, having a vision, a mission and a strategy. I'm in the right market. This is one of the questions I get a lot of feedback from uh, our, 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 our protégés who we talk to a lot. So let me give you a, an example of I'm in the right market. Uh, again, I'm putting on my consumer hat. Several years ago, a company called Garmin came out and they had this thing called the Garmin, a portable GPS you put in your car, take it around. It, it would take you any place you wanted to go. But since then, uh, every cell phone has uh, a GPS. Every car that I've seen has a GPS. Bottom line is there is no need, I don't think, to have a Garmin. And we hear this term sustainability all the time, but in my mind, your product or your service having legs on it for five, 10, 15 years, that is in fact true sustainability. Uh, if someone told me, hey, Mr. Smiley, I can make the best eight track tapes possible. Really? And, and they probably could, but the real question is, is there a need for eight track tapes? Not that I know of. Uh, and so things like that, you have to really, really make sure that there is consistent and long-term need for the products and the services that I provide. Really important. Uh, now during this pandemic at the very bottom of the last two bullets kind of point out, is my current business recoverable? Do I need to change locations? Do I need to change how I do business? Uh, those are key questions to ask yourself. In 2000, uh, September, 2019, we went from a full-fledged 7,000 foot office for our corporate office down to more like a 1,200 foot offices in my three vice presidents and other folks in our company at the staff level, they work from home. We set them up in a home office. This was before the pandemic even helped, uh, started. But the reason we did that, we, we make sure we could be more flexible. Uh, and it was a huge money savings. We saved $50,000 a year by going kind of a telework for some of our folks on our senior staff there. It's worked very, very good. There was a, some learning curves there in terms of 
uh, communications and staff meetings, but we figured it out through technology. But that's a $50,000 savings. For most small businesses, you probably paid somebody's salary for doing that. And then the final question on this slide here is, can another pandemic like the event close me down? Again, that's going back to see uh, if what you do or what products you make are pandemic proof. I don't think they're pandemic proof. Uh, no one is, but uh, this something you need to consider. Next slide, please. Uh, people and infrastructure, uh, again, that was one of the things we changed part of our business plan. It is probably so difficult to go to an employee and goes, I'm sorry I have to lay you off. Because in the back of your mind and your heart, you're really thinking, I just took food off that person's table. It's a, it's a tough thing to do. And so I encourage small business owners to have a growth plan for their company. You can grow 5% a year, 10% a year, or if you can count in employees or so forth, you can do that. Because I think in reality, if your business is not growing from some aspect of what you do, it's probably dying. And, and that's the effort, the 12, 13 hours a day the business owners put in. How do I redefine and stay relevant in the business market, whether I'm an uh, online vendor or I'm a defense contract like Snoring Technology, how do I stay relevant? And so that growth plan is pretty uh, important. And again, the services here in Arizona at uh, ACA, SBA, Small Business Development Center, the VBOC, all those services are great to have you doing that. But if you work in your business, you're the only person there or one or two people there, it's tough to kind of find time to do that. I understand that. So you got to kind of really build some time in where you can actually do the strategic planning uh, for your company. The next major bullet here is probably, it's, it's huge. And I want to talk about this. I'm glad Robert mentioned this about the PPP. And the question is, do I have a personal relationship with my bank? A personal relationship. 50% uh, of the people who lost their jobs were in the service industry. Those ones I talked about, airlines, hotels, restaurants, all those face-to-face, uh, -face, people to people type of business and services. However, what I've learned from the, the SBA in Washington, DC is that only 10% of those businesses receive the funds from the payroll protection program, more commonly referred to as PPP. And the real question is why? Talking to my bank, they didn't have a personal relationship with their banker. So when PPP first came out, I knew nothing about it. But the senior vice president of the bank that I bank with called me and told me about it and explained the rules and so forth like that. And so we did all the applications and then paperwork and things like that. And when SBA finally opened up the portal to submit your uh, application, we got PPP funding within 14 days, 14 days. That's because we had a relationship. And that brings me to a point that I wanna stress. I think there's a big difference between networking and relationship. And this PPP or getting access to that or knowing about it is a perfect example of that delta between relationships and networking. Our vice, senior vice president at the bank I bank with could actually sit down in this presentation and give you a full-fledged 20-minute presentation on what Sonoran does because she understands what we do. And she's our number one advocate. If I need to increase my line of credit, she knows our, uh, our company. She knows our financial history. She knows that. <clears throat> so that's real important. And while I'm on the financial thing, I want to make one more point that Jim and I talk about quite often when it comes to, uh, to finances. <clears throat> Your credit score is so important. It is vitally important. And the folks at score and SBA would tell you, you know, when you go to see a bank, please understand the five C's of banking. The five C's of banking. And I have the score people give you that one. But I can tell you, if you go into a bank with a 500 credit score, the Pope won't loan you any money. You got to really protect your credit score because that's what it's about. It's about risk. When we, when we go into the bank as small business owners, we all have the last, the same last name. And that same last name is risk. The first name is up to you, low, medium, or high. But recognize from the bank perspective, our last name as small business owners is the same. That is Mr. Risk and Mrs. Risk. Okay. Uh, and then having a credit line to, to, to draw from is important. Thank you very much. Next slide, please. So this thing called a SWOT analysis stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threat. And every small business has them, even large business have them. So what I'm gonna show you the next three slides is kind of three business, businesses that I kind of picked out. And uh, it's kind of a self exercise you can do yourself if you get the slides from ACA. But uh, what are the strengths of your company? What are the weaknesses? What are the opportunities? What are the threats? This goes part of your growth plan, your growth plan strategy. So I'm gonna go through three examples and I'll give you a few of my 
takes on these. Again, I'm putting on my consumer hat. Next slide, please. So here's the catering services. Like I said, here in Illinois, all of the uh, dine-in places are uh, closed for dine-in eating. And as a, as a result, catering companies have lost out on weddings. They've lost out on graduations. They've lost out on anniversary. They've lost out on a lot of opportunities uh, or events that support their business. So what I would recommend if, if you are a catering company, have a focus group and say, what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses, what are the opportunities, what are the threats for the catering industry? So I wrote down here, maybe you should go to a mobile food truck and I'm putting on my consumer hat. Uh, because one thing we know about catering companies, they know food. And so the real question is, how do I get our food to people? And so again, that's one example of a catering company. I, I don't have all the answers, I'm not in the catering business, but just throwing something out there. Next slide, please. A nail salon, quite a few of those around there. Again, I would encourage you to do a SWOT analysis uh, because here's what I realized from, uh, from a personal consumer perspective. Uh, people are going to enjoy the small pleasures in life. They're going to get their nails done. They're going to get a haircut. Uh, they're going to you know, take care of their pets and stuff like that. Uh, and so maybe it's a mobile nail salon, appointment only. But people are going to do that kind of stuff, I, I guarantee you. And if you don't believe me, uh, just go to one of the stocks and, and type in uh, PetSmart, which is uh, the pet store here. And, and look at that stock price. That stock price has continued to grow even during the recession and the pandemic because people are going to take care of their pet. Uh, I get a haircut every two weeks. That's just my military background. Uh, and so I'm not sure how the pandemic affects that. And the barbershops are open in Arizona when I go back, but I'm going to get a haircut. It just, you know, people want to do that. So they're going to take care of themselves. And so the question is, how can I find an opportunity within this pandemic uh, that, uh, that, that will help a nail salon survive? And then the last example is a trucking company. Uh, again, the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities and the threats, a group exercise. Uh, and, and Ken, you probably heard on the news, but here in Arizona, we have Interstate 10 that runs east and west. 80% or 75% of the goods that come from the Far East, China, Japan, and Asia area, go through Interstate 10 going westbound. If you're ever familiar with California uh, and in Arizona and New Mexico and Texas, you will see nothing but trucks going that way. These are, in fact, true frontline workers. They're delivering supplies and goods to the American people. They go, they do food as well, you know, things. So uh, there's opportunities out there to find out how we can do that, and maybe you want to partner with somebody if you need opportunity to uh, to get your goods and services moved, uh, because I'm sure the price of air transportation is probably sky high these days. So just three examples. You can put anything up there you want. But doing a strength, weakness, opportunity, to threat analysis of your small business is, is a good thing to do while you got maybe got some downtime. Next slide, please. The truth of the matter is that uh, uh, some businesses, both large and small, were on the financial ropes long before the pandemic arrived. Business plan was probably out of date or even non-existent. And so if someone says, well, I'm not sure how to write a good business plan, as I said again, and I'll re-emphasize this, there are people who can help you do this. It won't cost you any money out of your pocket. Uh, some people did not adapt to online buying. This has been around for quite some time. And I think what the pandemic did would just reveal it more to us to get this thing done. And again, I use my own personal example. I was looking for an outside uh, space heater for the patio. And uh, I went to Costco and I went to Sam's and went to uh, Home Depot and all these other places. Then I asked myself, why am I doing this? And so I went online and I had 17 outside space heaters to choose from. I picked the one I want, I hit enter, it delivered to my house. It's just fingertip. That's how reality is, is moving forward in terms of uh, uh, technology and so forth. If you travel a lot, you go to airport, we have these in, in the past, just a whole kiosk full of people ready to help you from the airlines. All those all remotely right now. You go to your local grocery store, you can put on your consumer hat. You see the self checkout. All those are job killers. So as we move forward uh, after COVID-19, how do you make your company more streamlined? Again, you have to have that person-to-person -person interface if you're in a person-to-person -person interface type business. But uh, I recently had to get some home insurance uh, from my insurance provider that I've been with 35 years. I never talked to anyone. I gave all the information online, secure uh, line, did a little chat. Uh, I never talked to anyone. Those are job killers. So uh, you know, the technology part, the digital part, the digital consumer 
if you haven't had that to your company and you can make it to your company, you know, please consider doing that. And I give you one more example from a consumer perspective. Uh, if you were building a restaurant, had a restaurant, if you don't do a drive-through, you won't last. I mean, just look in your own neighborhoods. You know, the, the, the carry out, the side, curbside pickup, the drive-throughs, they're doing pretty good. And they're, they're hanging in there. But out of drive-through or some type of expeditious food service, you know, you're gonna be challenging in the free service business. Uh, now, the, the final three bullets are things that are pretty dear to me because of my, 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 my passion for leadership and my passion for people. And that is, if you don't take care of your customers, I guarantee you someone else will. A friend of mine, she uh, was a nurse here in Arizona. She transferred to uh, Colorado. She came back to Phoenix for I think three or four months to her beautician until she found the right beautician uh, in, in Colorado. I've had the same barber for 20 years. I've had the same cleaners for probably 18 years. Uh, and I keep them because they take care of me. Because they didn't, I would take my business someplace else. So the question is, if you don't take care of your business, your customers, somebody else will. And, and know your competition. It's not always about money. It's not always about money. It's about service. It's sustained quality service. I mentioned I have the same barbers, same cleaners, because uh, I pay a little bit more for that. And people... I've had uh, USAA, I don't mind mentioning them, I've been with them for 39 years. I get calls from all kinds of insurance companies. Hey, we can beat their price. And they're probably right. They probably could beat their price. But the reason I don't change because the service is impeccable. And I know folks, if you military know on the phone, you have USAA, and they're not perfect, but I haven't found anyone to beat their service yet. So why should I change? And then finally, hiring the right fit talent is critical to your success. People have to buy into your vision they have to buy into your mission, they have to buy into your company's culture. And uh, this right fit talent uh, motif comes from the Disney Institute. And Disney Institute is the is business arm of the Disney Corporation. And so when you talk to a person at Disney, they will tell you, what is our mission at Disney? It's pretty simple. It's to make people happy. A lot of happy, so they can come back and make them happy again. So if you're, in the, if you're Disney, you're in the business of making people happy, why would you hire unhappy people? It doesn't make any sense. And then he doesn't hire unhappy people because they're in the happiness business. All right, next slide, please. So getting back now to more personal as a business owner, a question you should maybe ask yourself is, what shapes the customer's perspective of your business? And it just really boils down to one word, their experience in your store, their experience with your product, whether they bought it online, whether they bought it uh, through their cell phone app or whether they came in person and you know, did a face-to-face -face interaction with you. But that personal experience is important. Uh, we bought, my wife and I bought some, uh, some cups, coffee cups, monogram coffee cups online uh, several weeks ago. And we got them in the mail. And there was a little card in there. And the card was a thank you card. We appreciate your business, blah, blah, blah. But it, it was just a, a box with two mugs in there. It had a, a note. And what they're trying to do from my perspective is to uh, make you a repeat customer because we are human beings. We have passion, we have feelings, we have emotions and small things like that would do great to you keep that customer. So when it comes to customer service, I have this concept called a customer for life. You want that person to come back and tell them again, hey, I got great service at company X or company Y, but their perspective of your company is really based on that, uh, uh, that experience. And I share with you a personal experience because it's, it's kind of funny, but I, I think it's worth telling. Um, several years ago, about 15 years ago, there was a brand new restaurant in Goodyear, Arizona, where I live. And my wife and I, some friends from church, went there on Mother's Day. And I ordered a T bone steak. And the young man brought me, I think it was a strip steak, a New York strip steak. And I said, Excuse me, sir, uh, this is not a T bone steak. He goes, Oh, yes, it is. It's a T bone steak. And so the manager comes over, he, he hears this commotion, and goes, what's the problem? I go, well, I ordered a T-bone steak and I got uh, this. And he said, okay. And the young man, the waiter, insisted it was a T-bone steak. And I just, I just had to say something. So I said, excuse me, sir. The reason they call it a T-bone steak because there's a bone in the steak shaped like a T. <laughs> and people kind of start laughing, but that was perspective of it. The long short of that story is that for the next 15 years, we never went back. They closed at about five years. But I'm sure that experience of poverty experience a lot of people had. You get one shot to really make an impression on people. And so uh, whatever your business is, understand your consumer's perspective is how you treat them, how they feel uh, 
buying it and what they feel after it. Okay, thank you. Next slide, please. Again, again, what shapes their experience? Do they walk away with a smile on their face? Who they walk away with? You know, I got screwed over. I'm never going back there again. The whole thing about, you know, the sleazy car salesman was earned. It only took one sleazy car salesman to pollute the whole business experience of buying a car. And that's how it works. So how do you differentiate yourself from the competition? Experience. And again, I go back to Disney. They want you to have the Disney experience where you feel happy, you feel you got the most bang for your buck. And when you feel that way as a consumer, chances are you're going to come back or you're going to tell someone about that. Okay. So uh, if you haven't thought about this, please do that. So how do you get the you know, customers better? What makes them come back? These are all questions you can answer yourself. I won't get into those, but you know, what makes them take their business elsewhere? How do you communicate with them? If there's a sale, do you send them a thank you, a card or something like that, appreciating their business? Uh, I mentioned earlier about networking relationships. They're not the same thing in my mind. It could be. In fact, a lot of uh, industries will have uh, speed networking. But the reason, to be honest with you, about this networking relationships is based on one word. And that one word is trust. I never do business with people I don't trust. I don't care how big the dollar value, I just don't do it because you got to sleep at night. So when you add the word trust to relationship, you can see that from personal relationship is based on trust. Networking, I'm not sure it's based on trust. And uh, again, going back to the Disney model, because they have some great uh, promos there, is that under promise and over deliver. This is how you beat the competi competition. Over promise, over deliver, and have a very, very good customer service or, 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 or excellent customer service. Uh, in turn, the customer service term is actually kind of going out of, out of the way now. They call it the customer relationship. A lot of like Nordstrom and places like that. So customer, uh, Service is kind of a, a dated term there. Next slide. So engaging your employees and your customers. Uh, I think this is one of the most important aspects of running a business, engagement that. And again, it's about trust. Do your employees trust you to do the right thing? Do they trust you that you have their back? So I'll share with you a little tidbit what we did at Sonar Technology this year. Uh, last year, uh, we had 13 uh, Christmas parties around the country. We have people in 27 states. And so uh, I did quite a few of them. My vice president did a couple. And I was wearing a Spanx in January. I ate so much food at all these uh, parties. Uh, but this year, of course, through COVID-19, we cannot have all those parties because our employees work on a military base and they kind of locked down and things of that nature. So um, the question is, so what do we do? Well, we had this Christmas party money for each location set aside. Going back to our philosophy of people before profit, we could say, okay, we're not gonna have a Christmas party, leave it at that. But I got my staff around and goes, here's like to do, what do you guys think? I would take that money that we had set aside for the Christmas party individually and put it in a Christmas card and send it to our employees. That's the right thing to do. That's how you gain trust because that money was already set aside. But we decided to send it to them individually through a visa card and they get that money. People before profit. People before profit. Had I went back and been a guy who started a company where, hey, my number one goal is to make money, I wouldn't do this. But our goal is not to, number one goal is to make money. We, we, we're profitable, but people before profit. And that's an example. You can talk about these terms all you want to, but we try to live and demonstrate that every day. Next slide, please. So let's get into the leadership part. We got about four more slides to go. Uh, and, and the you factor, because you are the face of your company. And so inspiring your employees, start with your attitude. Now, if you went to work every day with the coffee mug and the smug look there too, people will adapt that personality. What's wrong with the boss? Or if you went there every day and you're condescending and kind of a narcissist in the middle, they're gonna, they, that's going to come as well. And if you went to the far right, all happy and bubbly every day, uh, that's going to cause some concern too. And believe me, having a last name Smiley, is, it's kind of a balance sometimes, <laughs> what, what you can and can't do. But I believe that genuine enthusiasm, loyalty, kindness, and honesty are contagious. And so when you see a company that's not running well, the culture is kind of bad, look to the top. You'll find exactly where it came from and so forth. And so it's all about the attitude. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is kind of give you a kind of a, a non-scientific math problem that emphasizes the importance of an attitude. So people will say, well, I, I'm a hard worker. Uh, I'm very smart. So if you took the letters A through Z, in the alphabet, 
and gave each letter a corresponding number up to 26. I'm gonna show you mathematically how important attitude is. Again, A is one, B is two, C is three, D is four, and so on. Next slide, please. So someone says, you know, uh, I know a lot. I got a couple of degrees, I'm certified in Microsoft, whatever, and, and I, I, I just know a lot of stuff, I'm, I, I'm good. We add those letters up for knowledge, you only get 96%. Well, Mr. Smiley, I'm a super hard worker. I'd be here 10 minutes early, uh, an hour every day to get the job done, important as well. But that only adds up to 98%. But they both fall short of 100. But attitude equals 100. Because here's the fact about attitude. I can't train attitude, you can't train attitude, and it's tough to get rid of people with an attitude. It goes back to this concept of right fit talent. Spend some time making sure you're hiring the right people who believe in what you're doing. They're there for the long run. They don't have one foot in your company and one foot out the door looking for the next best dollar deal. So it's important to, that you hire the right fit talent. That will help you through the tough times as well. We have about a 95% uh, retention rate at Sonoran. When people leave our company, they're going for a better job or uh, because about 85% of our employees are military veterans. You know, sometimes the spouse leaves and they have an assignment to career, so they have to leave. We, we get that. But when someone leaves because they weren't treated fairly or respectively, then, then I get involved. And so we try to have this culture of respect, honesty, and dignity so people will stay, again, that customer for life, but also that employee for life. Next slide, please. When I was a young lieutenant in the Air Force, our first assignment, our commander was a uh, old, crusty Vietnam lieutenant colonel. And, and he was good. He was really, really good. And he told us, he said, I want you to close your eyes. And I'm asking you this question. And the question is, how do people feel about you? And we opened our eyes. He said, let me tell you, it is foolproof. The way people feel about you is the way you make them feel. You know that Jim Pepper over at the SBA? That guy, man, he, that guy will pick you up at two o'clock in the morning. He will help you change a flat tire on a rainy day in Arizona. He helped you change a flat tire on 110 degree Arizona. The guy is a God fearing, just a loving veteran who loves to help people. Oh, we hate him. It doesn't work that way. It does not work that way. Some leaders you hear and some leaders you feel. So the question is, what kind of business leader are you? Are you the kind of leader that people hear and feel? Or they just want well, the boss is just talking crap, you know? He, he changes mind next week. Or do you feel them? Does he feel you? Where there's a child sick and the boss says, hey, stay at home, take care of your kid. That 101 fever, you know, you got to take care of that. Or whatever it happens to do to make sure they show compassion for you as an employee. So what kind of business leader are you? Big question to ask. Next slide. We've won quite a few awards uh, in our company. My name's on most of them, but I make sure that our employees and our staff know, hey, this was a total team effort. This is not the Paul Smiley Show. It is the Sonoran Technology Show. I have the privilege and honor of just directing it. And so Mark Cuban was the guest speaker. There's probably 600 people in the room in suits and ties and nice dresses like Miss Maria Contreras, who was a former SBA administrator. And Mark Cuban comes in this long sleeve t-shirt, but he's Mark Cuban, he can do that. But going back to this concept, leaders you hear and leaders you feel, I still remember the day uh, Mark Cuban, the words he spoke on that day to the, the business owners. And it was pretty much, it takes hard work to be a business owner, but whatever you do, don't let the naysayers steal your joy. Don't let them tell them you can't do it because you can do it if you put your heart to it, put your mind to it. But he would say, stay the course, believe in yourself, surround yourself with people who believe in you and your business venture, but don't let the naysayers bring you down. And that was uh, four, four years ago, he made that speech in Washington, DC. And so it was great to meet those business owners. We have a lot of wars in our company, but our employees know it is a team effort, not just me. Next slide, please. So someone asked me, uh, next slide. Someone asked me uh, several years ago in a, in a business forum, uh, go back one, please. Can you go back one? Someone asked me, so Mr. Smiley, what is the most important character trait, uh, one more ahead, of uh, being a business owner? And I thought about it for a while. Nope, wrong way. And uh, the word uh, humility came to mind, you know, uh, being humble. And oftentimes people will say, uh, humility is thinking less of yourself. That is not true. Uh, to, for me, humility means thinking 
of your selfless, hence the word selfless. And so every time I get an opportunity to reward and thank one of my employees uh, to put our company out front and put me in the back, I like doing that. I've made mistakes in our company. I'm not the smartest person in our company and my employees let me know I'm not the smartest person in the company, but I'm not supposed to be the smartest person in the company. I'm supposed to be the most informed person in the company, person who makes a tough decision when a tough decision has to be made. And I also seek wise counsel. Very seldom there's a major decision our company has to be made that I'll uh, you know, get counsel from my HR manager or uh, one of my three vice presidents. I bring them into the fold because I don't have all the answers and neither do you. And so uh, as you look in the mirror every morning, go back to that thing that I talked about earlier. How do people feel about you? It's how you make them feel. And so uh, I have no uh, tolerance for incivility. And so people make mistakes in our company, you know, you're not gonna get fired. But being disrespectful and uncivil, that is the number one reason you get fired in our company. I don't, I don't have the, the tolerance or the patience for it. So hire the right people, build good relationships, uh, put your faith in something other than money. You, you, you make the money. And then uh, reach out to the just a numerous amount of services that we have in Arizona. I mean, I want to thank Jim and Faith and Lisa and Robert for all the great work they do uh, helping us recover from this pandemic. So with that, that is the end of my presentation. Uh, I can send you my email address. I'm more than happy to do this. We do this for free. We make no money from it, but I'm all about helping small businesses uh, succeed. So that's it for me, Lisa and Faith. Back over to you. Oh, Paul, thank you very much. That was a great presentation. Um, we want to definitely thank Paul and, and Jim for, for presenting today and sharing their insight with us. Um, this presentation, as we mentioned, is being recorded and will be posted on our website so you can go back and review it along with the, the slide deck. Uh, so if you want to access some of those tools that were on there, you can download it. So things such as a SWOT analysis. But uh, we are very grateful for Paul and Jim and their time. Uh, could not do these sessions without their expertise and, and folks like them. So thank you very much. Um, we will get the contact information uh, for them as well, or you can reach out directly to us and we can get you in contact uh, to them. So with that, I just want to remind everybody, have a great weekend. Uh, please join us back on Tuesday morning for our PPP session. But until then, be safe uh, and enjoy this great Arizona weather. And yeah. have a great weekend. All right. Thank you, Robert. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Paul.